All right. If you have a Bible, a phone, or a tablet, open up to Matthew chapter 26, verse 17. So Matthew 26, verse 17. Uh, as you are opening uh, up, up to that text, um, we are getting closer and closer to Jesus' crucifixion. What we'll be reading today is actually the day before is Thursday. he would be crucified on a Friday. And imagine here that all of this is accumulating of the whole, from all of the Old Testament that God has put in place for, for bringing a Messiah, one who would come, that he would sacrifice for the sins of humanity from even before time began that God had ordained and planned this to happen. And then 30 years prior, Jesus comes in through, into the world through the virgin birth of Mary. And he lives this life. And at 30, he begins his ministry. And for three years, he calls a few guys to be his disciples, to learn from him and to watch him and grow. And as he goes and proclaims the kingdom, the kingdom that's coming, that is here and near and yet still to come. And now we're at this moment. We're at this place so close to where he will be crucified that everything that was planned, the whole purpose for him coming is about to unfold. And before the craziness happens, Jesus has this meal, this last supper with his disciples. And so we're in Matthew chapter 26 and we're in verse 17. And what we already know in the context before that we've read is the high priests have already gathered together. Their hardened hearts, their angered hearts have hit their point where they're now seeking a way to have him arrested and killed. But they kind of decided they would wait till after the feast, after this, the feast of the Passover, until Judas Iscariot comes to them and says, hey, what will you give me if I betray him? And so they make this whole deal. And now there's going to be a supper. And the one that's going to betray him is also at the same supper. And Jesus knows. But here's where we're at. Matthew 26, verse 17. It says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening... He reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been, been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, you have said so. Now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. And Jesus, we thank you that what we'll be reminded today is that you were the sacrificial lamb the lamb that was slain in reminder of this Passover meal, that Jesus, you would be that lamb. And it was your body that was broken on the cross, your blood that would be shed, that gives us forgiveness of sins, and that causes the wrath of you, God, to be passed over us and onto you, Jesus. And so, Lord, as we walk through this together, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'd speak through me. I pray that, God, you'd help us to remember 
as we partake of the elements today, as we remember, Christ, who you are and what you did, I pray that our remembrance would cause us to to be thankful and to be worshipful. I pray, God, that you would remove any... um, where we're, where we're so comfortable and uh, used to this story. Yeah, we know Jesus died for our sins. Yeah, we know he rose again. We know these truths, but I pray that, God, that they would be reminded in a fresh way today. In Jesus' name, uh, amen. So in verse 17, uh, it says, Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, this would have been mid-afternoon on Thursday, which is the date of, which is 14 at Nisan. And this is where uh, uh, there were preparations that needed to be made for this Passover lamb. This all Jews would have celebrated in this constant yearly reminder. And so what the goal was is, is they, would, they would have to get rid of the leaven out of their homes and make preparations for this Passover meal. Now, this Passover meal was, kind of, it was, was something that happened way back in the book of Exodus. And if you remember the story of, in Exodus with Moses and the Israelites, you know that God's people were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. God calls Moses to go before Pharaoh and say, hey, let my people go. And so God tells Moses, hey, listen, this is what, this is what I want you to do, but each time you do it, I'm going to reveal my power, and I'm going to unleash a plague. And so these plagues God unleashes on the Egyptians. But now there's the final plague, the 10th plague. And this 10th one, he tells the Israelites, he says, listen, you are to take this lamb, a year old and without blemish, and you're to take the blood of it, and you're to take hyssop, and you are to paint it on the doorpost of your home. And you are to have, there should be no leaven in your bread because the idea is that you are to be ready and in haste so that when God unleashes this whole thing, that you are ready to flee out of Egypt. And so all the Israelites obey God's command and they paint this blood on their doorposts. And that night, the angel of death flies over and anyone where there was no blood on their doorposts, their firstborn child was killed. And there was weeping, and there was uh, all throughout the land of Egypt, but not amongst the Israelites because they had obeyed God. Because the passing over, there was passed over. Why? Because there was blood. The blood of this lamb that was slain. And so judgment and wrath was not poured upon the Israelites because of this blood. And so after that, then Pharaoh lets them go, and they go, and they leave. And it's in that that they are that God delivers them from slavery and from Egypt, but then points them to a place, this promised land that he's saying that he's going to direct them to. And this Passover meal was something that they were to partake in annually to remind them of who they once were and what God had done and how he had delivered them. And so what would happen is they, there was a major preparation. There's lots of preparation went to, to put on this feast. The lamb had to be slain. And it had to be one lamb per household, a household that could be up to 10 to 12 people, which, hey, there's 12 disciples, so that works out pretty good. And they had to take this lamb and go to the temple where the priest would offer this sacrifice and take the lamb and pour it at the base of the altar. And then they would have to get the preparations for the meal, the unleavened bread and the cups of wine and the herbs. And so it was a lot of preparation for this. In Luke chapter 22, it says that Jesus sent Peter and John ahead to go prepare this place and prepare for this Passover meal. Now let me read you the story in Exodus 12 about this Passover meal. In Exodus 12, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. And tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb, according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. 
And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old, and you may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So this is happening. This is now Thursday, the 14th of when the Israelites will be meeting. Verse 7, it says, Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. And they shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. And anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. And in this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste, because it's the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And look at this. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the first day you shall remove leaven out of, the, out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from the land or from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. And no work shall be done on those days, but what, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statue forever. In the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of that evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he's a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your dwelling places. You shall eat unleavened bread. So here... Jesus gets his disciples, Peter and John, hey, go, and they go ahead, and what Jesus foretells of them, say, hey, you're going to find a man, and you're going to ask him to be, and, he's, and so Jesus gives them all the details of what to look for in this upper room of where they're going to meet to gather to have this meal. To celebrate this Passover meal. But what's interesting is I, it's almost wondering, did the disciples know in that moment and in that evening that now all the preparations have been met and they're now meeting in this upper room and they're getting ready to partake of this meal, this Passover meal. Did they know who, they were, who was sitting in front of them? Did they know that he was that Passover meal? Did they know that he was the fulfillment of this? That all of that Passover meal and then the yearly reminder of that feasting was all a shadow pointing to the one who would be our sacrificial lamb. Who would be the one that his perfect blood that would be shed would allow the wrath of God to be passed over upon us and, upon, and actually on his son Jesus. I wonder, do they know that? Did they have any glimpse of that, or was it not until after his resurrection that all of the, the, the light bulb came on? In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a verse here in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 6. It says, your boasting is good, not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? He says, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. And then look at the phrase. He says, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That Christ is sac this, this Passover meal, Christ is the sacrificial lamb. He's the lamb that God has provided. 
He's the lamb that John the Baptist said, hey, behold, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. That what's interesting, and we won't spend a lot of time here, but Jesus is both the, the sacrificial lamb that God has provided, and he's also the high priest by which we have access to the Father. If you think about the priests, just like these Jews had to go to the priest to offer their sacrifice. But it was still, even those priests couldn't enter, the high, enter into the holy of holies. They were into the holy part, but not the holy of holies. That was only entered into once a year by the high priests. And so Jesus is both our sacrificial lamb and he's also our high priest, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So verse 18 and 19, back in our text. So Jesus tells the disciples, again, Peter and John, from what we know in Luke 22, he tells them, and he says, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand and I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared the Passover. And then look at verse 20 to 25. It says, when it was evening now, okay, so it's evening now, they're reclining at the table with the 12. And if you, let, let's kind of set the picture up here. When it says reclining at the table, they weren't like what we have at our dining room tables where you're sitting on a chair. Most likely the table was low and they were laying on their sides with pillows. So they're reclining at this table. They're having this feast. They're having this meal. Now let me remind you, Peter and John have already made the preparations. They did the, the they did what Jesus told them to do. They found this man who had this space in this upper room for them to meet and have this meal. They've already went and offered the sacrifice to the priests, the, the lamb to be sacrificed at, with the priests. That blood has been poured at the altar. And now this lamb has been cooked. There are the herbs. There's the wine. The table has been set. And now they're going to feast together. With Jesus facilitating this meal. So now it's evening. It says they're reclining at the table with the 12, verse 21. And as they were eating, he said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, is it I, Lord? Which I, which I find interesting. They asked the question, is it I, Lord? And I, you almost wonder, like, I always thought it would be the opposite. Like, oh, I wonder who it is. Oh, he's been kind of suspicious lately. Like, it's weird that they ask the, is it I? But if we're honest, so often, we're often like, so here's a crazy story. In college, I had a fundamental, a fundamental music class, and we did very basic things in this uh, elective that I had to take. And so do you guys remember the old recorders that we, we played in third grade? We played them in college in this class. So we did this, we sang, we did some other basic things. But there was a part where the, the professor, she had us sing. Now we're in this, this classroom that's like a mini amphitheater. So at each row of desks kind of is one step up from another. So she's kind of on a lower level and she's having to sing a little bit of the song. And then she's like, stop. And we're like, what? She's like, somebody's off key. And you're like, is it me? Like, it was a real awkward moment for a second because I'm like, man, if she's going to call me out in the middle of the entire class, this is going to be, like, not good. So then she paused. She says that. She's like, somebody's off key. And then she's like, okay, sing again. So we start singing again. And now she's, like, trying to walk down our aisles to figure out who it is. And we're like, are you kidding me right now? And no joke, the guy next to me, my buddy next to me, we, we, his nickname was Schmitty, and she slows down near him, and I'm next to him, so I'm like, oh, this is going to be bad for either me or him. One of us isn't good. And because I don't have any pride in my voice. Like, if I have anything that sounds good, praise God. He stops, and she turns to him. She's like, it's you. And Schmitty, like, he's a pretty buff dude, and he gets red. He's like, are you? Like, inwardly, you could tell. He's like, you've got to be kidding me that this is happening right now. In the middle of a class of, like, 20 to 30 other people, and uh, but, but you, know, you have this situation, like, is it me? And I almost wonder, like, you thought, like, is it him? Maybe it's him. But they all are asking this question to Jesus, like, is it I, Lord? And 
And in verse 23, he says, he who's dipped his hand in this dish with me will betray me. Well, that doesn't bring any more clarity because they're all putting their hand and dipping in that. So that doesn't necessarily bring any more clarity here. But then verse 24, the son of man goes as it is written of him. Woe to that man by whom the son of man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Like he's saying this in front of the guy. We all know who the guy is. The rest of the disciples don't know yet. What a statement. And look at verse 25. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And look at the response. You have said so. I wonder what the rest of the disciples, like, yeah, yeah, sometimes you just wish you could be a fly on the wall in some of these situations. What was the tone of that room in that moment? I wonder if some of them are like, Judas? Like, he's been, he's been with us the, for this long period of time. You're telling me he's the one? Or I wonder if there was others who are like, I thought there was something up with him because I could see him sneaking some stuff in the money bags. Kind of what we talked about two weeks ago. We don't know, but either way, Jesus responds, you have said so. And again, we're not going to spend a lot of time there because we already talked about Judas two weeks ago. But then look at verse 26. Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. What a phrase to be added. Again, this is not a new supper. They're they're used to having the Passover meal. These men were Jews. But as Jesus takes his bread and he breaks it and he blesses it and gives thanks, most likely a traditional blessing that he probably shared, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who bringest forth bread from the earth. There's probably some form of blessing like that. And after he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave to each one of them. But then he tells them, encourages them, eat this, take this, eat this. This is my body. Interesting. And then that phrase, when he's talking about this is my body, seems to be correlating with sacrifice. Sacrifice. That he'll be giving his body as a sacrifice. Why? Because look at verse 27 and 28. When it talks about in reference to the cup. He says he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for for the transgressions or for the forgiveness of sins. So this same idea of this is my body seems to be correlating with how he refers to this wine and this cup, referring to sacrificial language. This is my body, or this is my blood, which has been poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, I don't know if these guys really fully grasped what Jesus is doing here until after everything unfolds. Again, we've already seen there's five times that Jesus says, hey, like, we're, there's, are there three times where he says, hey, we're going to Jerusalem where I will be killed. And each time he reveals this information, he gives a little more detail of how he'll be crucified and it'll be on Passover and all of these things. But then when he's crucified, which we'll see next week, it's almost like it was all doom. Our Savior is dead. What hope is there? Because they didn't understand the resurrection either. And so in the same way as he's unfolding, breaking this bread, giving them, take, eat, this is my body. Again, in reference to sacrificial language. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, and in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul also talks about 
eating this bread and drinking of this cup, both Luke and Paul are say that we are to do this in remembrance of me. That the partaking of these elements and the partaking of communion is to remember. Now, there's different words that people use. Uh, you know, this is the Lord's Supper. Some call it the Eucharist. Uh, the word Eucharist really just means thanksgiving or to give thanks. Or the idea of communion. Communing with God and with other believers. But it's this act that he's saying, he's saying, hey, take this. This is my body. And as this thing that Jesus begins there, that we continue as a church today, is something that we take of to remember. To remember, to reflect on, to be reminded of. So Jesus would go on and he would also then take the cup. In verse 27 and 28, he says, and he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. This cup representing his blood, this blood of this new covenant that Jesus would establish. Now, what we need to understand is that in this Passover meal, there was often four cups that were drank during that time and during the feasts. Uh, these four cups were taken from Exodus 6. And so Exodus 6, verse 6 through 7, let me read this to you. It says, therefore, or say, say therefore to the people of Israel, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So if you look, he says, I will bring you out. And then he goes on, he says, and I will deliver you from slavery, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. And I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Uh, these four cups are, are known as the cup of sanctification. Uh, the cup of sanctification is based on God's statement where he says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. This idea of deliverance. You're the cup of judgment. Sorry, the cup of sanctification is the first one. A cup of judgment or deliverance, which is based on God's statement. He says, I will deliver you from slavery. And number three is the cup of redemption, which is based on God's statement that he says there in Exodus, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And number four is the cup of praise or consummation based on God's statement, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. And so this cup where Jesus says a drink of this, is most likely in connection to that third cup, the cup of redemption of how God would redeem his people with an outstretched arm. God, through Christ's blood, is going to redeem us. See, the Jews use this third cup, symbolizing the blood of the Passover lamb. It symbolized blood. That blood that was put on the doorpost, that when it was there, death and wrath was passed over them. In the same way, this cup, this cup of wrath that Jesus will endure, that his blood that will be shed, will be shed so that we are redeemed, that we are forgiven of our sins. Again, that sacrificial, sacrificial language he says, my blood of the covenant, which is what? Poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let me remind you of blood. Blood's kind of a weird thing. You know, if you were new to Christianity, you came in here hearing about blood, you're like, what's all this blood stuff? But blood was really interesting throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Blood represented the life of an animal or a creature. In Leviticus 17, verse 11, it says, For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. 
I'm going to say that again. For the life of a creature is in the blood. And I've given it to you to make atonement, atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. It's why all throughout the law, God told the Israelites, listen, you can eat of these animals and this, but do not eat it when the lifeblood is still within it. Drain it out first. In Exodus chapter 12, 13, it says that the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you and no destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. See, when Jesus talks about this, this cup that you are now to drink, that his blood that will be shed for your forgiveness of sins, this new covenant that it declares, Jesus seems to be referring to the prophet Jeremiah. In, in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 30, chapter 31, verse 31, it says, Behold, the days are coming. Futuristic, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. Who broke the covenant? God never breaks covenants, but God's people did. He says, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This new covenant that's prophesied by Jeremiah is in reference to what Jesus is saying. Drink this that represents my blood, because my blood that will be shed at the crucifixion will be for your forgiveness, will atone for your sins. It's poured out, why? For the forgiveness of sins. So there's the old covenant. The old covenant was kind of this if then. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't, then this will happen. But there's a new covenant. A new covenant that allows us as sinners to have all access to the holy of holies. It's a new covenant that we don't have to offer sacrifices for our sins because there's been one sacrifice offered and atoned for. It's his perfect blood that was shed that atones for your sins and your, his resurrection that allows him to intercede on our behalf regularly. Let me read you a couple of things from Hebrews to give us some more clarity. In Hebrews 8.13, it says, In speaking of a new covenant, again, what Jesus talks about, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. But look at Hebrews 9, verse 1. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared. Now, if you remember the tabernacle, eventually when Solomon built the actual physical structure of the temple, you had the first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section, and it was called the most, excuse me, the most holy place. Having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. And of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. But into the second only, the high priest goes, and he but once a year. 
Because where was the, where, why, the high priest could only enter once a year, which was where? The Holy of Holies, where God's holy presence dwelt. And it says this, it says, but into the second only, the high priest goes, and he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. So this high priest would go into the holies of holies, and he would bring this blood that was offered from, this sac- from a lamb without blemish, and it would be offered for the people and for himself as well. Verse 8, by this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened as long as the first, first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age, as old covenants. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper. So the Old Testament rituals and all that, could it perfect the heart of the worshiper? No. Verse 10, it says, But deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. Verse 11, But, anytime you see the word but in the scriptures, you need to pay attention. Does that mean it's going to be a major contrast? He says, But when Christ appeared as a high priest, who could enter the holies of holies once a year? The high priest. He says, so when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tents, not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So this is this temple, this place that's not made of hands in heaven. It says, he entered once and for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood and goats and calves, but by means of what? His own blood. Thus securing what? An eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of filed persons with the ashes of a heifer, if they sanctify for the pure, or, sorry, with the ashes of a heifer, sanctify for the purification of flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, Purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The high priest in the Old Testament rituals and regulations of the law was yearly having to go and offer a bull or a calf or a goat to be offered for himself and for the people. Until the day when God sent the lamb that's of God, from God, without sin, without blemish. And through his death on the cross and his blood that would be shed is to atone for and it offers full and complete forgiveness of sins, but then is able to go and stand as our high priest before the Father in his holy presence on our behalf securing this eternal redemption. That what Jesus did and his blood and how perfect it was atones for every sin that I've ever committed. There's no more death that needs to happen because Jesus' death was sufficient. It covers, it forgives, it atones completely and he intercedes on my behalf able to be before the presence of God. Atoning. So the end there of of that Hebrew passage in verse 15, it says, therefore, Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Christ's death redeems us from everything. It's this blood, Jesus' blood, that gives us forgiveness of sins.
Isaiah 53, verse 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. What was upon him? God's wrath. So that we can have peace, peace with God. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we, like, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. Jesus' death. Jesus' blood, this cup that he is showing, hey, take this bread and take and drink of this cup, representing this new covenant. It's not a covenant based on works. It's a covenant that is me paving the way, atoning for your sins, providing a way of redemption for you to be declared righteous before God, and where you can become a child of God, and it's all by simple response of faith. Not works. Faith. Not works. Faith. Not religion. Faith. Not in your own doing. Faith. Faith in who? Jesus. At the end... In Matthew 26, verse 29, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. See, as we take the elements, it causes us to remember, but it also causes us to look ahead. And when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The partaking of these elements that we'll do here in just a minute is to remember, and it's also a reminder that we're waiting. We're waiting for the consummation. What Jesus says, hey, I will not partake of this, this, this cup again with you until the consummation until my kingdom is fully established, until I return. So until that day, just like for the Israelites, when God delivered them from Egypt and they were to partake of this supper and this meal, this Passover meal in remembrance, until he would send the one that would be the Lamb of God. We are to also partake, be reminded of how we've been delivered from sin and bondage And we're also awaiting what's coming. Church, if I can remind you, the one verse I read, and I don't have it written down here for me, but it says, for those who are eagerly waiting for my return. And I thought about that, like, am I eagerly waiting? Like, do I, am I, am I longing for him and what's next? But can I just remind some of you, that are in this room, where your world feels like the physical realm feels like it's falling apart, your body seems to be decaying, and you're struggling with health issues, and your world seems to be like it's not what you planned or thought. Can I just remind us as we take these elements today that we take to be reminded of what he did, but what's coming ahead. That Christ rose again, and he's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he's interceding on our behalf, and he's coming back. And the Bible says that our home is not here. This was never meant to be our eternal dwelling place. It's with him. And so I'm reminded that, like we said before, when trials come your way, I believe that God uses those to often remind us that the things we hold on to this world start to have less and less value and cause you to look ahead and say, God, I long for that. 
God, I long for no more treatments with cancer. God, I long for the day where there's no more grief of loss of loved ones. God, I long for the day where there's no more struggle with temptation. God, I long for when this pressure and persecution will, get, will, will ease up and be no more. God, I long for the day where there's no more fear of, of wars or betrayal or divorce or tears or death. This world is temporary. We're meant to live for eternity. If I'm honest, I always get caught up in just looking at the here and now and the earthly, and I forget that this isn't where I'm meant to be. I like being handy. I like working and building on my house and fixing things and renovating things. But I have this weird expectation that when I fix something or remodel it, that it should last a really long time until all the other projects are done. And then when they're all done, then, that, then this can get broken again. But I realize, man, there are things that I put a lot of work and time into. And then they start to quickly fade from the weather and rain or start to rot. Or my kids kick a soccer ball against the wall and it scuffs. And you're like, are you kidding me? I just painted that yesterday. Whatever it is. I remember I bought a brand new car after after college because my Ford Ranger caught on fire. And so the new car I got, and I remember like two months into it, I drove to a camp and I get there and I must have re- I realized I must have drove through paint that somebody must have spit out of someone's pickup truck because I had splattered all over my new car was all this paint. And then I also realized I had a ding in the door of my car. And that must have been from some, a landscaper mowing and must have flung a, a stone out. And I realized, all right, God, I think you're reminding me not to love the things of this earth. Because have you ever noticed when things are brand new, we like, really, we like baby it? And then when they're old, like my minivan that I drive around, you start to realize you don't care about it and you leave it a little dirtier than it should be because we weren't meant for here. 